Can I just ask, in, in, in relation to um, that last question, yeah. like there's three different agencies, if you like, here, arms of the legal services to the state. Mm. So we, we can generally quantify or take the different figures and quantify how much the legal costs are um, in layman's terms to the state. But did you ever look at the costs incurred by all of the government agencies and departments, or even the government departments, with a view to um, streamlining the service mm. and determining just how much the state is paying generally for legal services? Because it would seem to me that it is an astronomical amount of money, you know, when it's all gathered together. And you'd wonder if having a, not a one-size-fits-all, but, you know, a general approach drawing in the department spend as well would give us a greater idea of just exactly how much the state is spending and maybe how better that amount of money could be spent if you pooled your resources. Is, and I know this might be a policy matter, but... I'm still asking, someone yeah. has to ask. Is it not something that you would consider in the interest of the taxpayer if there was a savings to be made? Um, at the moment, the, the government um, procurement office is, in fact, doing work in relation to procurement processes, I believe, and, and the Chief State Solicitor may know a little bit more about this, as to... Um, local authority uh, work, for instance, if you include that in, as regards to the state, there's going to be a framework um, agreement and uh, procurement processes will be designed um, around that framework agreement as regards local authority legal work. Uh, very soon there is going to be, and this is again through the procurement, um, government procurement office, they will be looking at particularly the the uh, processes that will have to be, uh, procurement processes that will have to be undertaken from the po point of view of centralised government. Now, I'm sure that the um, government procurement agency has some sort of figures that they're working off from the point of view of introducing these sort of framework agreements as such. Um, incidentally, the, the um, framework agreement that is going to be put in place um, for central uh, government and for government departments I believe only covers at the moment um, the procurement of solicitor services it doesn't cover council all right um, it, 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 the idea is that they want to look at the issue of, of government departments are taking in quite a lot of legal advice from private sector mainly commercial type solicitors firms and the cost of that and how to bring that cost down. Now, I can say this, uh, Chairman, that uh, in looking at these issues, um, it's certainly our disposition that more money should be spent um, fortifying the Chief State Solicitor's Office and, and uh, centralising um, legal services and bringing that up to a certain level of expertise rather than paying um, a small number, because that's all who seem to be getting the, the solicitors' work um, uh, of solicitors' firms doing work for departments. But in in the in the uh, analysis of bringing forward this, these framework agreements that the government procurement office is, is doing, I take it that they have done the type of analysis that you're talking about, because they no, are taking they are taking a whole uh, a whole uh, of view approach. Don't, don't rely on them. Well, is my advice to you. And I'm saying this because there are procurement rules set down which are breached every day of the week with no apology to the government or anybody else that's trying to implement proper procurement across the government agencies and departments. And I would expect that those of you, all of you, that are at the coalface of the delivery of the services that you deliver and are required to deliver that you would be making recommendations to the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform because uh, the numbers of you know, firms that we see in our work at PSC is very small, working for the different departments, and the cost is enormous. 
For example, I just want to ask you this, uh, and I, I won't refer or make, uh, give the name of the, of the case, but it's just something that came across um, recently, where a barrister was being paid €1,500 Euro, uh, per day. Now, that went on for quite some time. It cost the particular um, agency a considerable amount of money, and therefore cost the state a considerable amount of money. Are you asked for your advice in relation to costs? Ask for you know, how much do you pay? For example, if I was a private company, I might ask my next door neighbour, private company, how much do you pay for that kind of service? Is that kind of comparison without procurement regulations or anything else, leaving that to one side, is that sort of common sense approach used by agencies of the state, departments of the state? on a regular basis, or is it, is, is it, does it just not happen? No, I, I don't think it happens on a regular basis. There isn't a proper formalized structure, although I am conscious during my time that other uh, agencies have come to the Attorney General's office to look, and I mentioned the sort of uh, indicative amounts that we might pay to see where they are about how much they pay. Equally, um, I'm conscious that the Chief State Solicitor's Office and the Attorney General's Office has been asked um, you know, to have input, for instance, to the Department of Finance in relation to this use of commercial firms that have been doing the high-end banking work, and that's, that's understandable. <coughs> but they would ask or they would um, draw on us to, if you like, do some form of assessment or help them or assist them in relation to how much they, they should pay. But if you're saying, is there an overall structure or a system as such, I would have to say to you, no. But is that a shocking gap in well, the general administration of departments well, and the spend of, say, tax, taxpayers' money, that there would not be some sort of arrangement whereby these comparisons can be made? And in fact, you know, again, to relate it to the private sector, I might say to another business, how much does that cost you? I might say, did the firm that represented you, were they any good? And you might get a reference. But it would seem to me that there is no cost comparisons, there is no references sought, that people are just being employed willy-nilly across the state sector. Um, and the other disturbing thing about this is that in cases, when the legal firms are employed, the citizen is often beaten up by the fact that this legal firm, supported by the state, would seem to have endless resources. And that is a complaint that I receive on a regular basis. And that the citizen, in spite of the case that they might have, feels hard done by because the powerful seem to get their way. And now we find out that the powerful have no even cost comparisons are a professional you know, opinion being sought relative to the quality of the individuals or companies that they're actually sourcing the service from? Well, uh, I do know the Department of Finance have put in place uh, processes in relation to taking on um, solicitors firms that they use. So th there is a process, there's a form of... But that's a different question. And I'm shocked that the answer to the question is that it does not happen on not just a regular basis, but as a matter of fact in the con conduct of the business of the state relative to the appointment of legal representatives. It's just not on that that would continue. And I, I, I would suggest to you that in spite of it might be crossing into policy area, that it's something that uh, you, know, you should be proactively engaged with in terms of the government and the direction that it's taking. Because it is a considerable amount of money. Uh, and in, in the case that I mentioned, I think it was a quarter of a million euros of taxpayers' money. 267,000. 267,000. And there are many examples of cases like that uh, that you, you would think, you, you can only draw the one conclusion, that it's squandering taxpayers' money, essentially. Could I move on to those uh, that created... Sorry, sorry, Mr Chairman, if I could just say one thing. I just want to correct the record in terms of um, 
our office being asked to assist with solicitors' fees, we were actually asked to assist with council's fees only, so I didn't have any visibility at all on what the department were paying on solicitors' fees, so I just want to, to correct the record. Yeah, that, that's another gap, and because I, the Department of Public Expenditure should be far more proactive in relation to one of the bigger costs to the state, which is the legal costs. And not only is there a legal cost, there is a human cost. Because I have seen many cases here where the state has wronged an individual. And while that might be proven at the end of the day, the fact of the matter is that a life or a family has been destroyed in the process. And therefore, I think that the two gaps that have been mentioned now need to be addressed, not only by you know, whoever is responsible for us here this morning, but also by public expenditure and reform. And, and someone needs to get a handle on the cost being incurred by institutions of the state with, with no reference whatsoever to its ability to win the case or its ability to get the best value for money for the taxpayer. And I, I'm saying that out of the experiences that we have seen here of money spent that just didn't achieve anything and where individuals' lives were damaged in the process of that. And that leaves them cynical about the state apparatus and how it's operated. Can I just ask you a, a question which I asked the Department of Justice last week in relation to a note I received? I just want to establish the costs of this type of thing and how often it goes on. Um, this was from an individual who had been summoned as a prosecution witness in a multiple larceny and drugs case that required a special sitting of the circuit court. And present was a judge, a 12-man jury, five guardi, senior counsel and a solicitor for the state, a senior counsel, junior counsel and solicitor for the defence, as well as four court staff. And the individual who sent um, the email tells me that the accused didn't um, show up. So you had all of these, this special sitting, you had all of these individuals there um, uh, paid by the taxpayer uh, and the individual concerned who took the bother to, to write to me uh, said that when he asked, uh, he was told that that's just the system in terms of that no-show. I mean, how often does that happen? Where, where is the fall down there in terms of, you know, all of the teams turn up to uh, carry out this case and hear this case, but the individual doesn't? Well, so most, most people before the criminal courts, Chairman, are, are on bail, uh, and they're bailed to appear in court on a particular date. Uh, and if they don't show, this is what happens. But the statistics show that in terms of people turning up for their trial, there's quite a lot of, obviously, people who are failed to appear in warrants issue for the arrest, that, that um, it is a, an unusual event for that to happen. But the person is on bail, and if they decide not to turn in court... So it, 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 that type of thing would be unusual? I, I, I'm not aware of other cases where it yeah. happens frequently. It can happen, but it's, it's, I would say that scenario you've described now, Chair, would be, would, would be unusual. Yeah, because it wouldn't want to happen too often. It's mm. a fairly serious cost, I would yeah. imagine, to have all those individuals there. Um, this is just a question. I don't know where it falls, but uh, where someone is awarded a considerable amount of money into millions wins the case, um, and that money <coughs> is held then, <coughs> paid by an insurance company and held by the president of the High Court. It's not ward of court. No, Chair, I unfortunately can't help you on this one there. The circumstances of why it was... It was uh, <coughs> the child was involved in an accident, yeah, and an the parents injury. then went. The child is, is now um, 18. Uh, I'm just interested because €5 million Euro was awarded in that case, mm -hmm. and it was awarded back in 2012, and the sum is being held by the President of the High Court, and the individual concerned, the child, mm -hmm. and parents have not received the benefit of that award. And the five million is held without it being in invested. Yes. And the parents, it cost the parents 6,000 euro uh, to access the court for a request to use that part, some part of that money to assist the child because of special needs and everything else involved in it. 
where, where is the breakdown? This is 2012, by the way. All right. So why is it be, how does it get held by the President of the High Court? Why is it not invested? Who is responsible in that area? Uh, and why does it cost the citizen again 6000 to go to court, to take on the state, to get the money that was rightly awarded to the individual and the parents? From the facts as you described them, that doesn't sound as if that should have happened. And that uh, doesn't sound right in the sense that that's not what, uh, how the system should work. I'd have to find out more about it, um, Deputy because, or Chairman, because uh, there may be some reason in relation to why the money was put into court and not perhaps managed more by the parents of the child. There may be a reason, I, and I, I wouldn't want to speculate. Equally, um, it is a little bit strange that an application... I'm just asking because the, the parents don't want um, to go into this ward of court. Yes. They're suggesting a trust. Yes. Um, it's for the benefit for the child, but it, for the child and, and presumably the parents are looking after the child. Uh, so wh who, is, who is in charge there? The President of the, of the High Court? I think the court service would be a first point of reference in relation to this query, um, Chairman and to find out exactly uh, what happened. But if you wish, you can um, <coughs> refer to the Attorney General's office. We'll, we'll try and find out, perhaps, because it is a... Well, a if you could make the process easier, it might help me to understand um, the issues here. Yeah. Uh, but it's odd, to say the least, yes. and I, I'd like to be uh, reassured on it and maybe you know, get the facts uh, beyond that. Just to clarify... Um, in relation to Deputy McDonald raised one case and I raise another and so on. If we we're to write as a public accounts committee directly to any of the accounting officers here relative to information, general information in respect of that, will we get that information in a general way or will you uh, say that I can't give you any information on an individual case? Well, start maybe, Chair, with, with our situation, which is governed by the Prosecution of Offences Act, and under Section 6 of that Act, certain communications with the Office have been designated by the Oireachtas as unlawful. Uh, so, I mean, I, I would suggest a starting point maybe to look at that and see whether or not we've, we've leaflets on it as well. But in general administration, we, of course, no difficulty dealing with any question of general administration, but if it's, it's case-specific... There, there may be problems. Well, the general administ uh, administration of a specific case. Well, if it's, for, if it's a specific case, there could be difficulties. I mean, part of the purpose of the Iraq to setting up this, uh, this, this framework, I suppose, is to make sure that the prosecution system is depoliticised as much as possible. Um, but that's, that's the caveat I'd entered, Chair, that there is, there is something in the prosecution. Well, I'm not politicising it. I'm simply acting and asking out of evidence that was given here in relation to the delay of cases and the ending of cases taken by the DPP. And where that evidence was given here, I want to test that against the fact by asking you the question. Hmm. So maybe without mentioning the name or whatever, we can get around it that way. But I am anxious to find out if in evidence to this committee are... Uh, by way of um, appearance or by way of writing, that we had received a complaint, we want to be able to test it in a general way against you. Is this fact or fiction? Uh, and it's only by doing that and getting a, re you know, a general answer to it that we will understand whether there is an issue for the individual or not, or whether there is an issue for your office or not. Uh, and it, if you like, uh, brings a closure to the issue that was raised at this level by an individual. 